Anyway, so I think we'll start now. Hi, everybody. I'm Ken Stern. I'm the director of the Bard Center for the Study of Hate. And I'm delighted that you're with us today uh, to hear Simon uh, Lee uh, share his insights and his work uh, with you. Um, it's um, it's interesting. I, I have an old friend from who teaches at Columbia University who a few months ago sent me this email. He said, I've been remiss in not taking the time earlier in the semester to introduce you to a colleague in kindred spirit working on the same issues from the other side of the globe. Simon Lee is executive director of the Hong Kong Holocaust and Tolerance Center. Simon is a virtual fellow this year at Columbia's Human Rights Institute. And if you can believe it, a student auditing my master's program on crafting the language of nonprofit leadership. In reality, of course, we are all lucky to have him in the class and benefit from his own leadership insights and experiences. So with that kind of uh, email from a colleague of Columbia, of course, reach out to Simon and it, it culminates in his talk today. So let me just uh, give you a little bit more of his background. Um, then I'll turn it over to, to Simon. He'll speak for about half an hour, give or take, maybe a little more. And then um, we'll have Q&A. And I encourage you to use the Q&A box and you don't have to wait till we finish to uh, populate some questions. Um, and I just wanna say that, that I know there are lots of issues that are happening in Simon's part of the world, but we're gonna to focus today not on those larger uh, issues, there may be occasions another time. Today is really, we wanna focus um, on the issues of uh, Hitler shirts, Nazi salute and swastika flags decoding Southeast Asia's strain fixation with Nazi hate icono uh, iconography. So briefly, uh, Mr. Lee was a former investigative journalist in Toronto whose acclaimed coverage of the redress of the overtly discriminate, discriminatory Chinese Head Tax and Exclusion Act helped push the Canadian government to provide an apology and reparations for the surviving head taxpayers. Through his current work in Holocaust intolerance education, Mr. Lee helps empowering teachers in East Asia to educate students about the difficult topics while serving in recent years as a visiting educator at the Amsterdam-based Anne Frank House, a visiting instructor of Yad Vashem's International School for Holocaust Studies, and most recently is, is uh, the email I read you uh, suggest the Historical and Dialogue and Accountability Fellow uh, in 2020 and 21 at Columbia University. So without further ado, welcome Simon. I'm so delighted that you stayed up. It's like one o'clock in the morning for you <laughs> with a time change, uh, but really appreciate your speaking to us um, and uh, you know, take it away. Thank you so much, Ken. It's really a great pleasure to be here. And also thank you to um, Professor David Stern, our common friend who uh, you also uh, are very, very, uh, um, uh, wonderful opportunity that uh, that, uh, that we can talk about this topic today uh, in from Hong Kong, where I'm at uh, at the moment. So uh, may I? Uh, I would just uh, share my screen uh, as we speak. So today's topic, rather long title: Hitler shirts, Nazi salute, and swastika flag. So in the coming hour, uh, uh, including the Q and A, uh, I hope uh, we will be able to uh, walk through. Uh, this very strange fixation in our area, in our region. Uh, why there is a strange um, fixation with Nazi symbols and iconography. And maybe to start off this topic, uh, let's start with K-pop, Korean pop music. Uh, K-pop, from time to time, you may have heard in the news that it made Nazi scandal. And the most recent one was from several months ago, uh, from this K-pop girls band, girls team called um, uh, G Friend. And uh, particularly the leader of this team, uh, Swan, uh, is pictured right here. And she was pictured hugging a mannequin dressed in a Nazi era German army uniform. So uh, as you can imagine, the photos triggered outrage online when she posted these photos on Instagram. Um, by the way, G-Friend uh, was a very popular uh, K-pop girl group, uh, just recently disbanded. Uh, and, uh, you know, not only in Korea, they're very well known 
uh, here in Hong Kong, uh, in other parts of Asia, uh, um, they are very popular um, K-pop band in a very cutthroat K-pop market. So right here on the screen, you see that one of her fans uh, wrote on Twitter uh, saying that Nasi are not friends or someone you can hug or look so lovingly at. They are killers. They killed 6 million Jews out of them, 1.5 million Jewish children. However, many Korean fans defended the K-pop singer. So one fan also wrote, quote, also to those blaming Swan, I'm sure she should have known better and Hitler's reign is indeed taught about in Korean schools. But there is one thing between being aware of Nazism, another thing about recognizing the Nazi uniform. So from here, uh, some counter argued and even um, further accused Swan and G Friend, her band of Nazism, alleging that the band, even in the past, had been charged for apparent anti Semitic symbolism. And many even noted Swan was since allegedly nicknamed Kitler, K I T L E R, Kitler by friends. So apparently, this is not the first time a K-pop group has garnered criticism over the use of uh, Nazi-era items. Um, as I said, uh, it, it's uh, if you've been paying attention to K-pop news from time to time, you know every other year or so, uh, you would hear uh, uh, how uh, the K-pop's so-called um, Nazism scandal. And Dream Friends Agency uh, later, in this case, issued a social media statement. Uh, and it's quite often in the K-pop industry, a bit rarely uh, it would be these singers or the band themselves who issue the apology. Mostly come from their agency. So in this case, uh, their company uh, issued a social media statement addressing the matter in full. Um, they apologize for the offensive symbols in Swan's photos. Um, and the message, originally in Korean, translates as this. It said the department in charge did not recognize there was a problem with the mannequin's outfit. We deeply apologize for causing controversy. So in this case, given how rarely a K-pop singer uh, in Seoul, uh, you know, so many decades after and so many miles away from uh, Europe, so removed from the Nazi ideologies of the Second World War. So it may be easy for us sometimes to think um, it, it, maybe it's maybe what they say is true. Like, I mean, it would be very tempting to accept the explanation uh, of Swan's team and the G-Friends agency by saying that, you know, um, it will be basically uh, ignorance um, and maybe insensitivities. So uh, from time to time, this has been the explanation uh, from Korean K-pop band to Thai band to Indonesian band. You know, uh, these are the uh, explanations or reasons that have been given from time to time in these uh, Nazi scandals. Uh, in this case, the K-pop's Nazi scandal. So I keep wondering, uh, with this fascination, you know, uh, with the uh, Nazi imagery in Asia, is it just the lack of uh, understanding of the Holocaust? Or is it uh, uh, just mere coincidental that uh, uh, these scandals happen? Because uh, all the time, there's uh, one word we keep hearing, is ignorance. So uh, I've been when preparing this talk, I keep asking myself, is ignorance the explanation for all these repeated incidents? Or could it be a bit more complicated than being simply coincidental? Because if you uh, read uh, analysis, uh, news features, uh, mostly they say, hmm, mainly because uh, these are not taught at school. Uh, for instance, in Thailand, uh, at schools, uh, they learn about Thai history only. Rarely they learn about what went on uh, in the Holocaust, even in China, even in Hong Kong. Uh, here, uh, of course, um, uh, we went through the Second World War in our region. 
uh, in, including Hong Kong, uh, which uh, experienced the Second World War for three years and eight months. But when it comes to the Holocaust, uh, it's not in the curriculum. And very often, uh, uh, it's only about two paragraphs long in the textbook. So could it be because of uh, a lack of understanding or could that be a little bit more complicated? So this is what I've been uh, wondering. And sometimes it's not easy to find an answer in the world of uh, K-pop in this case, uh, because you know uh, very often the fans would jump on anyone who dares to criticize their idol. So sometimes you know after uh, the first day and then in the news cycle, uh, it would uh, sometimes lead to fandom wars, and it would be very difficult to achieve any sort of uh, productive conversation about these about these topics. Just like this case right here. Again, another K-pop band, and in this case, it's the BTS band, uh, the South Korean boy band called the Bangtan Boys. And uh, as you can tell, apparently from the uh, from the screen right here, um, their rapper RM uh, was shown wearing a Nazi-inspired hat. So, hence, the lessons have often been forgotten. Uh, uh, in this case, it was 2018. In one case, it was only earlier this year. Again and again, these uh, history lessons seem never learned. Here you see a cosmopolitan story, um, kind of a provocative title right here, saying trendy teens in Asia are dressing up like Nazi. So, which means it's not only in Korea, obviously, it's also not just in showbiz, but Nazi items were seen quite frequently in Asian countries, and Nazi uniforms have even been seen in cosplay. And why in Asia, like dressing up like Nazi, uh, in, in cases like these would be seen as trendy? Uh, it's not a question that, um, that can be easily answered. But when we talked about cosplay, for instance, in uh, Southeast Asia, young people, uh, uh, by the way, when you say cos cosplay, we're talking about, um, uh, for those who may not, uh, who may be new to the term, we refer to those who dress up like uh, fictional characters uh, as, a, as a hobby. So again, in Hong Kong, it's also very common, uh, you know, the cosplay exhibition, cosplay uh, cafe, you know, uh, uh, um, it's a uh, uh, very popular for youngsters right here. And quite often, Nazi uniforms are one suit of clothes uh, that might pick. Uh, that's not quite the case in Hong Kong, but in other parts of Asia, uh, it's quite often, like uh, Japan, uh, Thailand, uh, South Korea as well. But not only uh, cosplay at, um, you know, joining a, uh, joining a party, or that, but you would also see uh, a, a blog post like here, for instance, you, you, Nazi, Nazi chic weddings are a thing in Asia. So here we refer to those young men, a young couple, uh, and in this case, a young man in this photo posing as Nazi stormtroopers for wedding photos. Um, it would not be difficult to find uh, uh, wedding photos of this sort uh, online. And you may be wondering, uh, why so? Is it merely a fashion statement? Or could this be, you know, something, again, more than a fashion statement? So I once heard a local comment saying that, you know, it's not uh, we have Nazi obsession. It's just that we quite like Nazi aesthetics uh, because, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, the uniforms uh, for those Asian communist countries in particular. They find that, you know, Asia's uh, communist regimes, they usually have very uh, dull, uh, formless uniforms. But when it comes to SS uniforms, the cut and styling, very appealing uh, on aesthetic levels. So some may even call that uh, the Hugo Boss style. So um, I recall one person explained to me saying that for them or for him, at least is an aesthetic uh, statement. Uh, it's just merely a fashion statement, uh, nothing more than that. But when I look at some wedding photos, I 
I, 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 I just find it a bit puzzling. If you look at this photo right here, um, the two gentlemen on the two sides of the photo, on the left, on the right, are in fact the groomsmen, uh, while well, the bridegroom in the, in the center, uh, with the German shepherd. And of course, uh, 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 I, I'm sure some of you may uh, recall that Adolf Hitler's pet uh, was a German shepherd. So would it be possible that these gentlemen, uh, while they design or you know think about taking these wedding photos, they have no idea what they were doing when they put on this outfit together, or when they have the German shepherd, or, or you know uh, uh, to design uh, uh, how this photo looks like. So I, I keep uh, having this question in my mind: Is is it pure ignorance that they have no idea at all, or might not necessarily be the case? On some of our local online forums, I once read an intriguing comment and explanation about why wearing a Hitler outfit in his eyes is all right. And his and his explanation is this. He said it was okay to wear Hitler outfits, but not the ones of Mao Zedong, for instance, not a Mao hat or Mao cap. It was because for him, Hitler already failed. And that's why it's okay, because Hitler already failed. And in other cases, like Mao, uh, he succeeded, right? So, so it's a different story. So that's why in his view, interestingly, he find it, it will be less offensive than wearing a Mao hat. Uh, but uh, uh, I mean, it will be uh, less offensive to wear like this in the photo, in the Nazi outfit, because Nazi, uh, because Hitler failed, than wearing a Mao hat. I thought that was uh, quite a comment. And speaking of Hitler's failure, on the other hand, um, there is also something unique at play right here: a disturbing fascination with the Nazi in the uh, in uh, in our region when it comes to the feeling that. Uh, Hitler symbolizes a strong man, uh, or a strong man uh, general, or leader, or some sort of nationalist uh, modernizers. So again, uh, uh, this is something uh, that uh, people uh, sometimes associated. Uh, I recall, uh, for once, I was in Shanghai speaking to students, teenagers. Uh, one 13 year old, no, 15 year old boy. Uh, spoke to me and uh, speaking about his view of Hitler. And I recall very vividly, he was saying that, uh, I know uh, Hitler did some terrible stuff, which means he know Hitler was evil. But he also remarked that he believed uh, it was at the time, at a chaotic time, a strong leader like Hitler was necessary. It was brutal, but necessary because chaotic times, chaotic times need a strong leader. So, so, um, so that type of view was not uncommon. And I came across uh, from time to time in different parts of Asia. And uh, sometimes when you tell uh, people, teenagers that the Nazi left Germany reduced to a pile of bubbles, uh, occasionally they were not convinced and unfortunately, Nazi iconography has been misused for these purposes in films and popular cultures, and this is one of the consequences. And I recall Rabbi Cooper of the Simon Wiesenthal Center once also mentioned about a speech he heard uh, by a major general in Cambodia. Uh, he was at the time uh, speaking to the police uh, of Penopen. And uh, Rabbi Cooper recorded this Cambodian general uh, speaking to also the high officials, uh, uh, remarking that, uh, or I should say, praising Hitler as a model for population control. <laughs> and uh, of course, it will be uh, uh, unbelievable when you hear comments like this, but this is uh, certainly not something uh, uncommon. And besides Hitler as a fashion icon, uh, here in Asia, Hitler also made his way into funny memes, as well as becoming a marketing tool. 
So uh, while some in our region of vaguely remember Hitler as a world leader of some sort, um, uh, one of the remarkable comments I heard uh, was even some even uh, you know saying that I don't know much about Hitler, but I recall he was a communist leader. Well, uh, many simply consider him uh, as a, a world leader, and sometimes uh, in, in in places like Thailand and Cambodia, certain books bookstores even place. Uh, Hitler's biography, Mein Kampf, besides Steve Jobs or other successful people's uh, uh, bio, uh, memoirs. And uh, it would not also be surprising, sometimes uh, business schools would also teach about uh, uh, Hitler as a case study, as, uh, uh, as his successful uh, uh, business uh, uh, tactics or strategies. And in here, in this uh, photo I'm going to show you is also sometimes uh, Hitler was also seen uh, as adorable because his appearance is seen as comical. So there's even uh, a term called uh, Hitler, um, uh, Hitler kawaii uh, or Hitler chic, uh, showing that the characterization of him uh, as being cute, uh, as being uh, adorable. So uh, Hitler as Ronald McDonald right here, or those with Hitler's likeness. Again, uh, if you go to some uh, uh, markets uh, to shop, uh, uh, it would not be uh, too difficult to come across uh, these dolls, uh, Hitler-like figures. And sometimes this uh, Hitler chic uh, also goes further beyond into, um, as I've just uh, used the term, Nazi kawaii, um, the cute Nazi. In this case, uh, Nazi enemy uh, anime uh, video game, uh, which had a very interesting start. Uh, it kicked off through a crowdfunding effort. So in a very short period of time, uh, way beyond the game editors, designers expectation, uh, it was raised uh, over, uh, I think 80,000 uh, US dollars, uh, more than 10 times than the original funding goal. Uh, and of course, in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a period of time that uh, way be, uh, much shorter than the original uh, expectation. And this game is called uh, My My Fu is the Fuha, uh, in which the Nazi leaders were turned into female anime characters. So this interactive uh, visual novel uh, is a parody visual novel, uh, as the game design, uh, designer called it. Uh, so in, in which the players have a choice of dating one of the five notorious war criminals, including Hitler, Himmler, Göring, Goebbels, and Rudolf Hess. So uh, in this case, in this one, uh, you have the profile here uh, of the female version uh, of Hit Adolf Hitler. So these anime characters don't resemble the infamous Nazi leaders you've seen in history books. They are all designed in young looking and the typical Japanese style, very big eyed uh, 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 anime characters, female characters. So uh, this is the Kickstarter campaign uh, I was just talking about. So uh, it, the game's description reads on Kickstarter uh, to quote, instead of leading a simple invasion of Poland, the German general Romo is stuck trying to prevent the world from descending into utter chaos as the anime uh, Fuha runs Germany into the ground at every turn, blundering at everything from military strategy to diplomacy." Unquote. So the game's editor was asked if he was comfortable knowing that some of his game's backers uh, were likely white nationalists or anti-Semites. And then the game editor uh, replied uh, to the press saying that uh, this gives him um, a mixed feeling. So you may wonder uh, why Kickstarter allowed the crowdfunding uh, uh, to kick off for this project. So uh, I, uh, when Kickstarter was asked by the media, uh, why so? Um, they said they decided it wouldn't remove the project because it was classified as a parody, as you can see from the title in the screen, and thereby that complied with this site's terms of services. So it's mainly because it's a it's parody. So first of all, that's fine. But of course, uh, the game editor 
uh, further told the press that the purpose of the project is to poke fun at dictators and said uh, this mindful waifu is the Fura project is in fact in the same spirit of other parody like Jojo Rabbit. So after a successful crowding, crowdfunding campaign, um, it, uh, this project was just uh, released in 2019. So I want to show you a trailer for this uh, parody uh, official uh, novel game project, which you can still find the trailer on YouTube. So it sort of gives you uh, the idea of uh, how um, uh, how this project, when we so-called uh, this uh, phenomenon of uh, Nazi Kauai, you know, how it made very acute uh, what this whole idea uh, is all about. And of course, when you watch this short trailer, you may find this uh, rather offensive. But having said that, let me just uh, share with you this trailer. Oh, sorry, I will start again. Sorry, let me just restart again. So there's certainly an odd connection between anime and Nazi. And uh, one obvious example also is that on Twitter, uh, you would also see Nazi on Twitter often have uh, anime uh, avatar. So uh, right here, uh, it's just very easy to bump into these uh, Nazi avatar. So it's not a surprise that things like this just keep on happening and, uh, and likely will continue. So um, just like from uh, Thailand, Cambodia to Indonesia, it's fairly common to encounter vendors in markets selling Hitler t-shirts and uh, swastika, sw swastika mugs, or uh, in this case, um, different types of banners. And uh, these local uh, shopping markets uh, have regularly been the target of outraged Westerners. And uh, I'm sure if you've got a chance to uh, uh, travel uh, in these Asian cities, uh, again, and uh, uh, I think this photo was taken in Bangkok, uh, it, it would not be too surprising to come across this in the markets. But locals also sometimes, on the contrary, complain that uh, for them, there's less cultural baggage uh, attached to Hitler in their cities. Uh, I mean, they haven't been uh, uh, invaded by Nazi Germany. So uh, just like uh, back in 2014, um, I recall that the Indonesian pop star Ahmed Dhani uh, was criticized for dressing in a uniform, not dissimilar to those uh, worn by SS officers in a music video promoting uh, presidential candidate, uh, Zubinanto. So uh, while he was asked about that issue or the scandal, uh, Johnny remarked that he was saying, what is the connection between German soldiers and Indonesia? And so he asked, we Indonesians didn't kill millions of Jews, right? So basically he was saying, uh, uh, why, while Nazism is a European taboo, 
uh, in Indonesia, uh, there's no Nazi taboo. And it doesn't mean that they deny the Holocaust happened, but they just have less cultural baggage attached to Hitler. So uh, why should we uh, also uh, be uh, 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 follow uh, what the uh, the West uh, 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 constrain uh, uh, them on. So I just I just also recall it was uh, a few years ago uh, the tourist uh, the Chinese tourists uh, while they give the Nazi salute uh, uh, in a photo uh, in a photo taking uh, time uh, again um, uh, they were remarking saying that uh, it is my personal freedom uh, to do. Uh, what I like to post. Uh, it is my freedom and uh, and I don't have that taboo in my country. Uh, so, uh, and I'm not uh, denying the Holocaust. So why so, you know, well, why do we have to follow? So uh, it would not be uncommon sometimes in online forums to come across these type of comments. Uh, again, uh, this made lots of headlines back in 2014. So when I uh, spoke about the Asian resistance to these criticisms uh, regarding uh, the locals' questions about the right, what right Europeans have uh, to determine what's offensive, uh, what's not, or why they have to, or why uh, Asians have to follow. Uh, on the other hand, uh, one thing it also complicates the matter was that while Nazism is a, a European taboo and a swastika, of course, uh, is something uh, that, uh, uh, again, uh, Asians uh, find it a bit uh, puzzling because while swastika, uh, on one hand, is a centuries-old symbol of peace and it's often in our region associated with religious beliefs, so the history it has been uh, uh, go on for centuries, for a long period of time, much longer than uh, when it was used by the Nazi. But having said that, uh, some people would be wondering, ah, could it be possible uh, that sometimes uh, while people were showing the swastika, it was confused uh, with the Buddhist symbol or the Sanskrit uh, symbol? But uh, the answer is not quite. Because when you look at the Sanskrit, uh, Sanskrit uh, or the Buddhist symbol on the left, uh, it is different from the swastika, the Nazi swastika on the right. Uh, the Nazi swastika tilted the Sanskrit or the Sanskrit or the Buddhist symbol at an angle of forty-five degrees, and the corners always pointing upwards. So that's why, while this restaurant in Mumbai, uh, near Mumbai, was using this sign. Uh, of course, uh, you can tell it was using the swastika, the Nazi swastika, uh, but also uh, the name Hitler was used in the, in the restaurant's name. So uh, in, in this particular, particular case, uh, whoever puts this up uh, uh, wanted to make a statement about how great he thinks the Nazis are. So I think in this case, it's rather apparent. So there's also a view that uh, people in the West are also guilty of using imperial Japanese symbolism in flippant ways, which would spark strong rebuke in places like South Korea or China. Again, that gets um, uh, complicated. Uh, while uh, uh, I'm sure you must have seen uh, this flag and in uh, many places, uh, particularly those countries which were occupied by Japan in the Second World War, uh, this flag, uh, it's very sensitive because for many, it was seen as a symbol of imperialism, Japanese imperialism. So again, um, in certain uh, countries in Asia, um, locals would see the West casual attitude to the Japanese flag uh, would also be troubling. And hence, uh, you may uh, see from time to time, they're saying that, ah, uh, why uh, there were these Nazi taboo? But while the West sometimes uh, treated uh, these uh, other Asian World War II taboo uh, in a rather uh, casual manner, uh, treated all the uh, taboo in, in Asian context rather casually. Uh, or just like this Washington Post article from last week, uh, asking why was Japanese World War II propaganda uh, on display uh, outside the Metropolitan Museum of Art? 
uh, again, it just took place uh, last week. So the problem is uh, Sasamoto, uh, uh, the um, Japanese uh, artist, uh, or the woman photojournalist. In this case, uh, she was a very successful photojournalist in a male-dominated world. Uh, she was born in 1914, so she's actually now 107 years, 107 years old now. Uh, but, she, but not only she was a successful photographer, but she uh, was also a propaganda photographer uh, for the Japanese government during World War II. So her work supported the violent Japanese colonization of Southeast Asia, and uh, and hence it made uh, made her uh, and uh, her work so controversial. And in this case, uh, of course, it would lead to the Asian communities asking, uh, why was her propaganda work uh, on display outside the Met? So uh, this just gives an idea uh, when we talked about or when we dissect the Southeast Asia's uh, strange fixation with Nazi iconography, uh, uh, it's not just coincidental sometimes, it can be a little more complicated than that. And I try to tap into the mindset of some of the uh, frequent feedback you might have heard uh, when explanations uh, uh, surface. And lastly, um, in my opinion, most people in our region in Southeast Asia uh, have no or little knowledge uh, or opinion about Jews. And the main conduit of anti-Semitism today is, however, the internet. Um, I think the problem of anti-Semitism in our region runs deeper than we think, and it is expressed more openly in the anonymity of social media uh, rather than in our you know, daily face-to-face -face interactions. And that a lot of anti-Semitism is also being peddled widely and freely on the web. And here in Hong Kong, uh, where recorded anti-Semitic crimes are extremely rare. But when you go to online forums, uh, you would from time to time uh, see some nasty comments. Um, even our center, uh, Hong Kong Holocaust and Children's Center, our Facebook page, uh, from, from time to time, uh, not always, but sometimes you will also see some hate comments uh, right there. So there's a long way to go when it comes to uh, education. Uh, and in, mean, in the meantime, uh, a new generation of users uh, of the younger social media platforms like TikTok, um, I don't know if you use TikTok, but TikTok hugely popular in Asia. And, um, and they are being introduced, uh, these young users of TikTok are being introduced to anti-Semitic ideas. Uh, they would be unlikely to encounter elsewhere, according to a very new report which was just released uh, last month. So uh, again, uh, you can find that uh, new report, uh, which was done by, done by the campaign group called uh, Hope Not Hate, uh, talking about how social media like TikTok are uh, bringing anti-Semitic ideas to new generation. Uh, to close, I just want to show you one quick clip about uh, Thailand, since uh, Thailand, in fact, from time to time, also uh, uh, receive uh, uh, criticisms regarding, uh, uh, you know, very easily, you would come across a Nazi iconography and imagery uh, in the city. So uh, what do uh, Thai students think? So again, uh, here's a one little bite, a sound bite uh, from a new story that I would like to uh, share with you. In, in the YouTube or social media like Facebook or Twitter, I see Thai people talking about Hitler in a good way quite a lot. Like they see Hitler as like the strong dictator or the good leader that bring the nation to something better. But I think they ignore the other side or the thing that really happened and the people that get killed or get hurt from the thing that the Nazi have done to Europe. Thank you so much. And that's why in Hong Kong, uh, we still continue our work, not only serving Hong Kong, we also uh, got uh, invitations from Japan, Indonesia, uh, Taiwan, um, uh, uh, Korea uh, to do this. 
uh, in Japan, there are some smaller size Holocaust centers. In Indonesia, I know they are starting one up next year. So again, uh, with uh, more uh, uh, Holocaust centers appearing, uh, uh, being established in Asia, uh, hopefully it will lead to a more discussion. Maybe I didn't give you uh, lots of answers today, but maybe these questions uh, perhaps will be some uh, food for thought for our, our Q&A session. And again, uh, thank you, Ken, uh, for the invitation. Well, thank you so much, Simon, for sharing all that with us. Um, the, the graphics and the analysis were, were great, and I really appreciate it. I think we all learned a lot. So let me uh, encourage people now. I know there are a couple of questions that I will ask, uh, but if you have other questions, please feel free to populate them. I have a bunch of questions, too. Um, but let me start with a, a couple that have been submitted. So uh, how are these young Asians learning about Nazis and the Holocaust if it's not part of the curriculum in schools via the internet? And is there a fine line between dressing up as Nazis because it's trendy and aesthetic and the beginning of a, a thrust towards taking in hate and anti-Semitism? Mm. Very uh, important question. And in fact, uh, uh, when we talk about Asia, it's... Uh, 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 different countries, uh, different parts of uh, Asia are different. Uh, for instance, in um, Hong Kong, in uh, China, in Taiwan, because uh, uh, they, these places were occupied by the Japanese uh, during the Second World War. So of course, Second World War uh, played a part in the curriculum. So they, they do study the Second World War, but of course it, it's more about uh, what happened in Asia Pacific during Second World War. Uh, but then through learning that part, uh, you, you must, they must have learned about uh, the European uh, uh, side during the Second World War. And here's how the Nazi Germany and, uh, and, and the Holocaust would come into the textbook. But as I said, in Hong Kong situation, uh, 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 it was just usually one paragraph or two, max, when it came to the Holocaust. Uh, so uh, mostly they would just learn about, ah, six million people. Uh, maybe just the figure, just the numbers, uh, but but uh, not putting the face uh, in the Holocaust. Uh, some, interestingly, they may have learned a little bit more if their schools, and usually it, sometimes it's from English class because they do uh, Anne Frank's diary, or they may be reading a Chinese or Korean or Japanese edition of Ellie Wiesel's Night. So sometimes it could be from language classes because they have more uh, flexibility of doing that. But, uh, but let's say in Hong Kong, where my center uh, uh, is located uh, doing Holocaust intolerance education, uh, sometimes it, it, it is the teacher who thought that is important. I want to teach more about it. Uh, but the teachers themselves, I'm so glad you asked this question, because teachers sometimes find it is very hard to teach this topic. Sometimes they may want to teach, uh, they may have some, for instance, international schools, uh, they may have some more flexibility in the IP curriculum, they may want to bring us in. Uh, 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 but if they want, but if they want to teach it, the teachers themselves want to teach it, they are always uh, uh, worried about traumatizing the students. And, and how not to dramatize the students, how to bring students safely in and safely out the topics are also very challenging. So it's not just about, uh, 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 you know, whether it's not a curriculum, because even if it's not in the curriculum, teachers wanted to teach it, but they find it very difficult to teach it. And that's why they seek our help. Uh, and we also train teachers to, to, to how to bring students safely in and out of the topic. And regarding your second question about uh, uh, the line, how do you draw from Nazi aesthetics? Uh, because they like the Hugo Boss style. Uh, they don't like, you know, the a communist type of doll uniform. And in cosplay, for instance, uh, uh, how do you draw a line that whether it's acceptable in cosplay, you know, to uh, or, or not? Uh, it's a very tricky question because uh, uh, let me give you one example. In one of the cosplay uh, uh, convention, I, I don't, I'm not in the cosplay field, but I, but sometimes I use the word exhibition or convention or party, you name it. Uh, 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 for 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 a few years, they allow uh, a Nazi type of uh, outfit uh, as long as you uh, um, to for them to attend. But once there are more and more people doing it. Uh, uh, and then, if, of course, the complaints would come in, and it got more media attention. Then they then they stopped. 
uh, there has always been an argument about about uh, about uh, aesthetics and uh, and so forth. But again, I think the, uh, I think it's very clear. Uh, uh, while people find it offended, uh, and 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 of course, in all these countries that I mentioned, there are Jewish communities there, and and, and out of uh, respect, and and again, uh, uh, it is also a, a good lesson to start this conversations and dialogues. So uh, so in Hong Kong, uh, it's very common uh, when we approach these people saying that, you know, this is a highly disrespectful and, 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 and they understand. And, and, and I haven't come across a case that they would say, I insisted on uh, wearing it uh, or, 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 or so. So I hope uh, this is a very short answer but to a very important question. Thank you, for that, Simon. Let me let me just follow up because uh, one thing that was interesting to me too is, mm. as you were pointing out, I mean, you're speaking about different parts of Asia and the commonality of the use of the imagery. But as you point out, I mean, the history of World War II, there were countries on different sides. I mean, Japan was a part of the Axis with Germany. China was, you know, fighting, um, you know, the Germans and the Japanese and so forth. So the, there's a, um, you know because it's part of their history too, just on different sides of where they put in the, this you know, world battle, even though the Holocaust is a sort of subset of, 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 as you pointed out, what they're teaching, is there a difference that you can relate to the fact of which side people were on uh, to how these um, icons are playing out in culture? Mm. Uh Again, um, uh, that also leads to uh, a meaningful discussion in, in our region, because uh, when it talked about history and icons, uh, one thing uh, that has been highly sensitive in our region is about how history was portrayed, uh, wartime history was portrayed. So uh, uh, again, you know, when it comes to uh, Japan, Korea, China, uh, for many years, uh, the history textbook uh, 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 have very different focus, and some, uh, and even on the spectrum about, uh, 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 let's say, in uh, 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 Japanese uh, classrooms, the, uh, when it covers sexual slavery, comfort women, or when it covers uh, 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 the, the Nanjing atrocities, or, or you know, uh, or comfort women in Korea, all this, how much it was emphasized, or how much it was. Uh, um, uh, uh, focus or, or the figures, the, how many people died or how many victims, all these were, were all varied and it led to huge controversy regarding whether lessons ever learned if textbooks were not even uh, being really accurate. So there have been, so there have been uh, uh, efforts, joint efforts by these countries to co-write textbooks together, historians of uh, Korea, Japan, and, Ch and China co-write history textbooks together to talk about, you know, as you uh, bring up uh, icons, history icons, or or even when it comes to uh, uh, the uh, uh, European uh, uh, the war theater, is, th is is there something we can talk about uh, 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 to work together uh, so that it will be um, uh, uh, will be more meaningful when it comes to history historiography, uh, uh, and and it's it's definitely uh, not easy, and when it comes to uh, the Holocaust being taught in Asia, uh, again uh, one common uh, 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 way to do uh, uh, for classrooms for teachers here is to see. Uh, the, 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 the perpetrators, the, uh, uh, the victims, and the uh, uh, bystanders, and the upstanders. But again, uh, there's one category, which is, uh, again, highly sensitive uh, when it comes to uh, all these countries that I mentioned in Asia are collaborators. Uh, uh, it is uh, uh, highly uh, uh, controversial. So uh, there, there has always not been an uh, easy, uh, uh, easy, uh, uh, consensus uh, uh, on this. Thank you. And a related, <laughs> yeah. related question is, I'm not extremely well versed in the history, but since Japan as part of the Axis powers committed, uh, was an imperial power in Korea and other parts of Asia and committed atrocities there, how come there does not seem to be the same negative association with Nazi symbolism as there is with the rising sun flag, for example, could it just have to do with Nazi Germany being so distant compared to Imperial Japan or a lack of Jewish diaspora communities in Asia? 
unlike in the West. Mm, or a combination of these factors as well. Uh, uh, yes, on one hand, uh, uh, when it comes to the Holocaust, it, it, uh, we know this is a universal uh, a, a tragedy, but, but uh, quite often you may uh, hear uh, comments, local comments saying that, ah, this is a European event. Uh, uh, and, and it's very distant. And, uh, but of course, you may be surprised. There were one of my research focuses on the Chinese victims in the Holocaust. And it's rarely known that there were even Asian uh, victims who died in the camps. But of course, these are very, uh, uh, these are the topics that were not uh, quite often uh, discussed. Uh, on the other hand, uh, China had a, had a role to play because uh, the Shanghai ghetto, in fact, uh, housed the most number of Jewish refugees uh, who escaped uh, Nazi Europe. So uh, more than 20,000 uh, refugees, Jewish refugees, uh, uh, found, their, uh, uh, you know, uh, found a safe haven uh, in Shanghai. And hence now there's a Shanghai Jewish Refugees Museum. So again, uh, this history uh, was less known, but they are not, but, but I, I'm, I'm trying to illustrate the point that there's a connection. So hence, uh, we, we are trying to uh, uh, do this uh, educational work uh, in the region. But you're also right that uh, Jewish diaspora communities in Asia uh, uh, were relatively small, like in Taiwan, around 1,000 uh, uh, sit, uh, uh, Jewish uh, uh, citizens, I mean, Jewish uh, 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 residents right there. In Hong Kong, around 5,000 to 6,000 in a population of around six, more than 6 million. So uh, again, uh, 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 you know, a topic like this, uh, hence, uh, it's important. Uh, very rarely, they, they see this as Nazi imagery or iconography and how, uh, uh, you know, disrespectful they are. And I, can, I cannot find a better uh, platform than, than, than discussing these ideas in the Bath Center for the Study of Hate, because these are all hate symbols. Great, thank you. Let, let me follow up on one thing that you and I actually have talked about uh, a little before too. Um, so just as a backstory for our audience, one of the things that happens at uh, from time to time, I'm on the, uh, involved in the Gonzaga Institute for the St Study of Hate. It was the first uh, institute like that started. It held a conference last week and it's been around 20 years as a journal. But from time to time, the issue pops up. Well, aren't we really talking about getting people to, you know, to work together? Aren't we talking about peace? Aren't we talking about, mm -hmm. you know, things ab about managing intergroup conflict? And I frequently come back to saying, well, I'm interested in a broader set of issues, not just that, but the reason why hate's important is I give the example of Japan, that from time to time you read stories of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is for those who may not know it in the audience, it's one of the quintessential uh, documents about Jewish conspiracy that was a czarist forgery that led to some of the pogroms and, you know, well over a century ago but it pops up and there's very little Jewish community to make peace with there, but it's a set of ideas about how the world works, which is really what anti-Semitism is at its core. It's conspiracy theory about Jews trying to control the world, harm non-Jews and giving an explanation when something goes wrong. Ah, it's the Jews behind the scenes. So you had mentioned in your remarks too, that from time to time Mein Kampf, which is also a seminal piece of literature, you know, from, my, from Hitler, uh, positing, we have to have this war against the Jews because it's, it, you know, the Jews are trying to destroy us. This is self-defense. Obviously, there are other things in the book too, but there are, you know, those passages as well. So I'm trying to understand how much of what you're seeing with these images is just because people don't know and it's sort of cool and they're stark and they're, you know, vivid and they're strong uh, and they really don't know and how much of it is related to the fact that, that these ideas about Jews as reflected in the books I mentioned seems, seem to be big sellers from time to time in parts of Asia. 
Yes, yes. Uh, uh, not only the, the original versions, but uh, there are, you know, uh, anime version, uh, you know, uh, updated version, annotated version. And you're right, uh, 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 in, in bookstores, whenever, <laughs> whenever I visit an Asian city, I always go to the bookstore. And I don't know whether it, I should say it's coincidental. I always come across a local edition of Minecon. And, uh, and I think it was just not in the news not too long ago that it, they even talked about uh, uh, in Turkey, the Minecon cells have been soaring in years. Uh, uh, sometimes it would be because they, they do special promotion, <laughs> uh, uh, cutting the uh, discounted copies. But, uh, but I always uh, wonder why uh, that is the case, like the Chinese uh, 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 version as well, and the comic version uh, as well. And and and, and there's a, uh, the anime version, let me put it this way, that I've seen. Uh, again, uh, the, 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 the draw Hitler and other uh, Nazi officials are in an anime way, and, and, and they just try to make it uh, readable, because uh, again, you know, for youngsters, when they pick up an older version, older Chinese translation, or Asian Chinese translation uh, of the old uh, uh, version of Mein Kampf, it may not be as easy to read. But there have been recent efforts of trying to retranslate it to, uh, uh, again, that's a very divisive issue because I come across uh, uh, other Holocaust educators who have no, who, who, who ask, why, do, why on earth there are people, a country still selling these books and not just selling these books, we, redesigning and, 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 and all that in the market. But while on the other hand, uh, 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 in Hong Kong, uh, uh, to give you a more complex picture, in Hong Kong though, when it comes to Jewish uh, stereotypes, uh, it's not quite about um, the anti-Semitic one, but, but this, and on, on, the, on the other end of the spectrum, there are also other type of uh, books about Jewish you'll find in bookstore. Uh, very interesting. What 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 are these books? Whenever you try to find, hey, can I find some books relating to Jewish in a bookstore? On one hand, you will see Mein Kampf and that type of book. But on the other hand, it's always about uh, the Jewish, the Bible of Jewish way of making fortune, or like the Jewish wealth making Bible, how to raise your kid in a Jewish way on financial literacy. There's always a stereotype about Jewish is very good at making money, for instance. And, and uh, of course, it's not a healthy type of stereotype, but, but nothing harmful. They do not see it as something harmful, but, but they have a very strong stereotypical image saying that, ah, oh, we should learn from the Jewish on how to make uh, 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 money. Uh, 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 sometimes they think they will see, ah, oh, because the greed is involved. So, so there could also be some negative connotation, but, but, but they see them all as a role model in that regard uh, uh, to give you a sense. So it's always uh, uh, not, quite in, in, at least in my city, <laughs> in this part of the world, it's not quite about the anti-Semitic bit, but it's a, a strange stereotype, uh, another type of strange stereotype, I would say. Yeah, that's, that's a whole other conversation of philosemitism <laughs> and, and positive stereotypes is driving bigotry. It doesn't only happen to Jews, but anyway, that's a, a, I appreciate that point. So we have about a, a, a minute or so left. So I, I want to give you the final word to describe a little bit more about, you know, your center and what you see yourself doing over the next couple of years. And then I'll send out an email to people tomorrow, just reminding them of the link to the center. But I want to give you the final word talking about you know, what you're doing and your important work for the next bit of time. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, in Hong Kong, uh, our center uh, on one hand, uh, uh, is a, uh, our main mission is education. So from uh, uh, visiting schools, training teachers, as well as uh, public uh, education. So, uh, uh, and from the Holocaust to uh, other genocides, uh, 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 that we have been following. Uh, in fact, next year marks the 85th anniversary of the Nanjing atrocities. So many comfort women, uh, comfort women means uh, uh, the victims of sexual slavery uh, will pass. Uh, uh, I think there are less than a handful left uh, uh, right now. So uh, our job uh, uh, on one hand uh, is to uh, 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 
uh, to to preserve the testimony, but also when the te when the survivors are no longer with us, uh, how can we uh, uh, bring their stories to uh, classroom? So one key thing uh, we do, uh, 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 besides interviewing them, is to bring in uh, some uh, new. Uh, technology in which uh, there were some interactive biography. They can speak with Holocaust survivors and comfort women survivor. So uh, uh, our new direction uh, right now is to so search about what happened uh, after survivors uh, passed away. Uh, uh, what would be the new page of Holocaust education? So on one hand, we teach uh, we do an exhibition. You can find some of our resources online, uh, but uh, we are also doing lots of thinking about post survivor stage. Uh, what would Holocaust and genocide education be like? So I hope maybe that will be some other topics we could uh, talk about in the future. And in fact, I recently uh, our team uh, did uh, translate maybe did advertising uh, uh, Ken's uh, article on hate studies. So I personally find hate studies a very important uh, discipline. Uh, maybe in the past hour, I hope that also convinced you it is. And uh, Ken had been uh, written a very uh, 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 a very powerful introductory article on the interdisciplinary studies of hate studies. And in fact, uh, I, I really I always adore Bart's curriculum on that. So finally, there's a Chinese uh, 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 version of it. And I hope uh, for those of you who know Chinese who are watching right now, uh, it uh, will be, I guess, a handy later on uh, on uh, the Bart Center for the Study of Hate website. So stay tuned. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, everybody, for spending part of your day. Uh, learning from Simon, and I look forward to the time where you can come and we can, you know, hang out at Bard and okay. have you interact with students and faculty in person as opposed to in a box on a, on a Zoom setting. But thank you very much. Now go to sleep. Okay. <laughs> it's it's 2 a.m. Right okay. Okay. <laughs> Take you so care. Much, thank you, Simon. Take care, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.